Hey there, I'm Steve, and welcome to Jamson Entertainment. And welcome to the conversation. Just before we get started, there are many ways you can help. You can like and subscribe so you never miss a conversation. But most importantly, please share this video. Get the word if there's a community where we can talk about all the things that we love. Today on Throwback Thursday, we're looking at Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Given by that title, I don't know why I didn't think I had to correct myself again, but... Spoiler alert! You've been warned. For Wrath of Khan. Unfortunately, I can't help but spoil the ending to Wrath of Khan because this movie opens with the ending to Wrath of Khan. Or at least the very important death scene of Spock. In the climax to Wrath of Khan, the Enterprise is severely crippled. And Spock goes to the engine room to fix the problem because Kirk wants to escape with warp. But they don't have warp capability. I'll just say it is probably within the time top five death scenes in cinematic history. I can't go into detail, not because it's spoiling, because I already kind of gave it away, but I can't possibly do it justice. You have to watch Wrath of Khan in order to get the full impact of it. But just before Spock goes into the room filled with radiation, Dr. McCoy is down in the engine room trying to stop Spock from going in. But Spock, Vulcan nerve pinches him, does a Vulcan mind meld, and his last words to him is, remember. What this did was transfer what's called the Catra. It is the Vulcan soul or consciousness. It's kind of left to interpretation. It makes more sense if it's like consciousness, but since in reality we don't really know what a soul or consciousness really is, the two really are one and the same. So after recapping that in Search for Spock, Sarek, played by Mark Leonard, is Spock's father. And he comes to Kirk because he feels that's where Spock put his Catra. No. And you look at the security footage to find out what happened exactly. And so Kirk, against the orders, collects his crew, commandeers the Enterprise, and goes to Genesis. Now, there are parts that I'm not going into detail for, because even though the movie is pretty straightforward, there are some comedic moments that I'd rather you watch instead of me explain them to you. They're just far better <laughs> if you watch it. Mostly, they deal with Spock's consciousness coming through McCoy. The movie is also starring Robin Curtis as Savick. Now, the only reason why she was recasted is because Kirstie Alley took a role on the very famous, very popular sitcom Cheers. So there were scheduling conflicts. Merritt Buttrick reprises his role as David. Kathy Sheriff, Christopher Lloyd is the villain in this one. He's the Klingon named Krug. And Robert Hooks as Admiral Morrow. I got a little ahead of myself as I do in a lot of my reviews. Admiral Morrow is approached by Kirk about taking the Enterprise to Genesis to inspect it and see what's going on with it. And he says no. They already have a team working on Genesis. Genesis. They don't need Kirk and his crew. Despite Kirk telling him, like, there's more at stake here, he tells him about the Vulcan Catra. As much as the Admiral sympathizes, he still denies Kirk the opportunity to go and help his friend. How the Klingons are the villains in this movie? Captain Krug comes across the Genesis Project. Although each time it's been presented as a way to create new planets for colonizing, the villains each see the destructive side of Genesis, where if it were long on a already habited planet, it would erase what's there for the new world. Fun fact, my parents saw this in theaters and my dad immediately recognized Captain Krug as Christopher Lloyd. <laughs> now this was before Back to the Future, so dad's reference for Christopher Lloyd was a sitcom called Taxi in the 70s. And my mom was like, no, that can't be Christopher Lloyd. My dad saw through the makeup. He's like, yeah, that's definitely him. I can see how my mom was confused, not only because of the makeup but because of his character from Taxi, Reverend Jim. And Reverend Jim is just a stoner. <laughs> And Captain Krug is anything but that. As much as I love this movie, I do realize the flaws in it. I, I won't go into all the details, but there are some plot holes and plot contrivances in here. For instance, the whole story revolving around Spock. But for me, and for many, the story overrides that. It allows you to suspend your disbelief more than usual. Because it's in sci-fi fantasy. In the fact that at the end of Wrath of Khan, when they have Spock's funeral, he 
he's in a torpedo tube and he's launched in the same direction that Genesis is forming. And it's explained in this one because gravity was in flux, like it was like gravity on the planet was forming, that the tube soft landed on the planet. And since then, Spock's body regenerated from going through birth through adulthood with the planet. And the planet is unstable because David and his mother Carol use proto matter, which got me thinking. I wonder if they use this small snippet from this movie, the writers of The Expanse. That's a book series that became a Amazon series that's pretty good. Major part of the plot of that story is this proto matter, since they both use the same term, and Star Trek is a huge influence on sci fi. I can only imagine that they were like, oh, <laughs> Why don't we use that? Now, for some reason, Carol Marcus does not make her way back into this movie. Probably scheduling problems. But the other weird thing is, when the Klingons are looking at the briefing video or introduction video of Genesis, it's Kirk giving the explanation. Virtually the same as the previous explanation given by Carol Marcus. I don't know why they didn't use her footage. They could have saved a little money. What's also really fascinating, yes, pun intended, <laughs> about this movie is the Klingon language. Now, there are some spoken in the first movie, but there is far more spoken in this movie. What makes it so fascinating is that I'm going to have to look him up and put it in post, but the man who invented the Klingon language came up with words that to lip movement look exactly the same. What I mean by that is the whole movie was done in English and in post, after this guy came up with the Klingon language, they redubbed the lines. It's not a perfect redub, but it's extremely close. The reason why is because, as I explained, he made up words that use the same construction of vowels, consonants, and lip movement so that the dubbing isn't completely horrible. And that is an extremely interesting way to come up with a language. And using the method that he used to create this language, despite the unorthodox way that Klingon became what it is, it was only about 15 years later or so where it was being taught as an elective in colleges. Now, it might have been like two or three colleges but <laughs> it became a language you could learn and now it's a language you can learn in apps <laughs> i really love this movie and it comes highly recommended those are my thoughts on star trek 3 the search for spock let me know your thoughts in the comments below thank you for watching and live your imagination